Roganoff. The trouble was they all looked and tasted exactly the same. <laughs> Obviously, the chef had a kind of memory of you know, the Russian experts, because that was all they had in the 50s. They were all called Boris or Ivan, and they would go down to the number one restaurant and have beef pajowski. Um, <clears throat> right, enough of that rambling. So, um, after two years in China, I, I, I went and worked in Hong Kong, and that was an extraordinary time because China was in a sort of stop-start, stop open-close, liberal, not liberal, sort of zigzag sort of progression. It went on from about 18, uh, 18, sorry, 1981 to about um, 1989 when they decided to kill the students. Now that was a very interesting time to be working in Hong Kong because a lot of young writers, young artists, young filmmakers would come to Hong Kong and I was editing a translation journal and I got to know a lot of them and some of them became my close friends. And it was really exciting to, to see this great sort of flowering of, um, of artistic talent coming out of what had been a, a cultural disaster zone for so long. And it was a very exciting um, time. But as you all know, very sadly, that time uh, came to an abrupt end in um, June 1989. Uh, an event which is still um, commemorated with, with great passion in, in Hong Kong, but has largely been forgotten in the rest of the world, unfortunately. And with that event in 1989, by which time I was in New Zealand, I really turned a, a huge corner, and I just decided I wasn't going to be involved anymore in translating contemporary Chinese literature or, or even being involved at all, because it was just too painful watching my friends being um, literally hunted through the land, mugshots of them on the TV and stuff. It was very, very nasty. And um, after a period of time, I myself, in fact, more or less went to pieces after Tiananmen. And after, after a year or two, I decided, right, I'm just never going to do anything later than the 18th century. I wanted my writers to be dead and buried and not, sort of not, not in danger of their lives. You know. Um, and that's really what, what's been the case since then. I've worked on mainly um, classical literature. Um, and, and then, I'm not going to sort of give you the entire sort of story of my life. That really would take too long and be so boring. But uh, after a bit of teaching, I then decided that I really was not cut out to be an academic. And I'm really not. Um, I feel profoundly uncomfortable in academic life. It always have done, but I just keep having to go into it in order to pay the bills. I'm being totally honest with you. Um, so, uh, but then I, I just decided that's enough. Uh, I'll go and be a farmer. <laughs> so, I decided when I was about 30 that I would be a gypsy. That was a complete disaster. The gypsies did not want to have anything to do with me. <laughs> I actually bought a caravan and dragged it along the back alleys of Berkshire and parked it just up 50 yards from a gypsy encampment. That was the last thing they wanted. You know, they were just busy. They would just get up at night and steal all the vegetables from the local farmers' fields. They didn't want some sort of hippie idealist being a gypsy. That was complete. It lasted, that, that fantasy lasted about four months. Um, but I did want to be a farmer because I thought that would be, um, you know, I'd read so many Chinese poems about going back to the countryside. But of course, they all had servants, you know. <laughs> I mean, Tai Yen Ming was not that poor, you know. He definitely had someone to fill his glass, you know, to put what he always called the thing, you know, the wu, you know, Bei Zhong Wu. I, I love the way he calls it his booze, because Tai Yen Ming, the greatest poet, I think, in Chinese history, was definitely an alcoholic. And he was in total <laughs> denial, so you couldn't even call it wine, he just had to call it thing. <laughs> the thing in the cup. And there's a famous poem where he just talks about thing, not even in the cup, you know. It's a classic alcoholic behavior pattern. <laughs> but despite all of that, you know, and he had servants, so he wasn't really a poor man. Um, but I loved his perch and I thought I'd go and be a farmer. So having saved up a bit of loot in Hong Kong, it's a good place to get loot, that's why I'm going there. Um, <laughs> I, bought a, I bought a vineyard in the southern south of France, not the posh side of France, but the <coughs> posh part, and 10 acres of really rough vineyards and decided that that's what I would do. And so I sort of broke my back, literally, um, sort of, pruning, and, but it was a great five years, I don't regret it. I lost huge amounts of money. Um, I, I just sort of experienced 
what it was to be a peasant farmer. You know, it's hell. It's really horrible, you know. I mean, I used to have PhD students coming to visit me from Hong Kong, and they were sort of, they were these sort of very, very sort of protected young ladies who would be writing PhDs on something, or, and they would come to finish off, you know. I was regarded as a sort of finishing school in the south of France. And they would come and they'd say, where's your farm? And I would take them up the hill and, oh, but where are the laborers, you know? <laughs> No, I'm the laborer, this is what I do, and I'd get out some sort of primitive looking object and say, this is what I hit the earth with. <laughs> so five years of farming, completely broke the bank, and I had to go back into academic life. It's a, it's a story of, you know, of my life. Really. Um, I do have a picture or two of the vineyards and so on, but I probably won't get around to this. I really want to stop at this point and having earlier on um, expressed my gratitude to, to the, the um, members of Akia and, and saying how you know, wonderful I think it all is. I, I now want to pass to older people and, and just talk about three of my, my teachers. Last year was a very bad year for me because my three mentors and teachers all died within the space of a few months. And in fact, two of them died within a fortnight of each other. Professor Hawkes and Professor Liu actually died within a fortnight of each other. And, um, I was going to a lot of funerals and writing a lot of obituaries all through last year. And this year hasn't been a great deal better. Um, but I, I don't want to go into that. I want to just talk about... Um, oh, that's the vineyard, yes. Oh, can we have some lights off? Can we? Lights, lights off. Okay. McCann, Mr. D, you know all the stuff about lights. Down lights. I, I press off, but it just doesn't look awesome. No, it doesn't look happy at all. <laughs> why, isn't, why aren't they going off? Why can't we just have switches on the wall? <laughs> that would be too sort of efficient. <coughs> we won't see the pictures. Yeah. Oh, there, is, there isn't a switch by the door, is there? <laughs> okay, so I've got some pictures. Pictures gives me a chance to sort of get my breath back. This is the this is the vineyard and the house. Some of you have seen this, so please forgive me. Um, it's a very very beautiful part of the world, and I'm going there in a month's time, and I'm looking forward to it. This is this is. Um, David Hawkes, who I think is a name that will be familiar to many of you, who was my teacher, my collaborator, my friend, and my father-in-law, and a truly amazing, wonderful person, uh, a towering genius. Um, and this is him when he was a young boy. He was so cute. And there he is again with his family. There he is up in the top right-hand corner. Um, this is him when he was a young man and so good looking. He's taking, this is, you can tell from the bamboos that it has to be somewhere in China. And he went to China in 1948. I was a graduate student at Peking University at Beida, where he studied with all the most eminent scholars at the time, and had the good fortune to live in Peking during the last days of the old. Um, he was also a chain smoker at that time. There he is wearing a, a Chinese um, jacket. There he is uh, again in Peking with his young wife. He went all the way out to Peking to marry him. Um, there he is with the poet William Empson and his wife. William Empson basically came into David's life a bit the way David came into mine. I mean, David arrived in Peking, he knew nobody. He'd just gone out there on the off chance. And William Empson, one of, one of the outstanding poets of that period, happened to be teaching at Peking University and took in um, David had him stay with them. Uh, his wife, Hetta, was a South African sculptor, uh, both wonderful people who had a huge influence on David, who was always, uh, like me, uncomfortable in academic life, preferred the company of um, writers and artists and musicians all his life. Um, here he is with, with the Emerson family. They had two beautiful <coughs> children. Um, and uh, uh, it's William Emerson sort of in the foreground. This is the wedding uh, of David and Jean, 
and my, my, my father and mother-in-law in the grounds of the old British embassy in the legation, as they called it, in Peking. I, I could go through all those people in that picture, but it would be a whole talk in itself. In itself. This is some of the most famous people at the, of the time, apart from William Anson, whose beard does look extraordinary. It's actually a fault in the photograph. The beard doesn't sort of stick out like that. <laughs> a fault in the photograph, and the person sitting, uh, standing, sorry, next to William Empson was um, a very distinguished Cambridge literary critic called I.A. Richards, and so on and so forth. The thing is full of interesting people. Um, this is David when he became a, a, a faculty member back in Oxford. The person on the right is one of the greatest scholars of the story of the stone, a gentleman by the name of Wu Shuchan. This is Arthur Whaley, who was David's great friend and mentor and an extraordinary looking man he was. And these are paintings painted for David by uh, a great landscape painter who's now 93 and is still alive. And this is a, a traditional Chinese landscape painting of David translating Hong Kong Manga. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a genre piece painted in the style of an 18th century painter um, uh, by a virtuoso landscape painter from Hong Kong called Ra Zhuni. Piece of Calligraphy by the same person, uh, again, in honor of, of, of David. This is David translating Hung Among in his study in Oxford. I like that picture because of the light coming in from the window. And this is him in later life, um, sitting outside our house in France, which he always loved visiting and felt um, a great affection for. And this is him playing the recorder in our house in France. He, he was a, a very good recorder there. There he is sort of probably frowning at some stupid remark of mine. Uh, over <laughs> this is him in a, in a Catalan restaurant. You see the gay colors looking and um, smiling, which is, and I, I like to see that. This is him two weeks before he died. Um, the man was, had incredible courage and humor and, and dealt with physical adversity with incredible, um, I don't know, miraculous uh, panache, you know. I mean, he was very ill. But he wanted, we, this is in the grounds of the wonderful Glyndebourne Opera House in Sussex. So, so literally, actually three weeks before he died, he, we took him to see um, <clears throat> Vorjak's wonderful opera, Rusalka, and he loved every minute of it. He spent about three weeks preparing for it because he had to sort of, you know, it was difficult. And this is him, the same period, with a wonderful expression of wonder in his eyes. He's, he's looking at the hollyhocks. Um, it's David among the flowers. Um, this is another of the great, sort of wonderful people in my life. Uh, the person on the right is the young Yang Xianyi. Yang Xianyi was, was my honorary teacher. He was the chair of my board of examiners for my PhD. And he was the, the greatest living sort of translator in Peking for 50 years, really. Um, he, 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 he had worked for Chiang Kai-shek before the so-called liberation, but then he went over and worked for um, the foreign languages press in Beijing for, for just about all of his life. And that is his very beautiful wife, Gladys Taylor, who he snatched from her boyfriend in Oxford. Um, <laughs> literally, yes, it was, a, it, was a, it was a big story. Yang Xianyi was the son of the head of the Bank of China in Tianjin. He went to Oxford. Um, he had so much money to spend, he didn't know what to do with it. His father was very, very wealthy, a Tianjin sort of millionaire. And uh, he would just sort of um, go to Paris for the weekend and take all his friends. And, have, and, and, and he, was a, he was a bit of a playboy, actually. And he got a fourth-class fourth degree, which he, he was very humorous about. He said, it's a very rare kind of degree, he said. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was an incredibly talented uh, literary figure, not just a translator. He wrote wonderful essays in Chinese and um, sort of held court, really, at Foreign Languages Press. Um, until he became too old. In fact, until, until the events of June 1989, when he went on television on at least three international television channels, denouncing uh, Deng Xiaoping and Li Peng as a gang of fascists. Right. Very, very brave man. I was in the New Zealand uh, television studios one evening, in fact, uh, during, during May 1989, and, and, and all the people in the television studio were, were, were huddled around the screen as the, as the feeds came in. And there was this old man, and they were just listening to him 
denouncing uh, the counter he called them counter-revolutionary fascists. Um, that's the people who were running the country at the time. And they were just saying, 